Well, welcome back from your break. I hope you've been studying this beautiful diagram. That's about as complicated as we'll get for this next part of the talk. That's the, most, that's the hard part. We'll see how hard that really is. Okay, but technical details, you know, the accounting. How do we actually calculate a thermodynamic variable from molecular dynamics? And recall, molecular dynamics has dynamics in it. You know, so we're actually solving equations of motion. But now we want to do something else. We want to relate what we solve for. What's the temperature for this system? What's the pressure as for the various temperatures? How does the temperature depend on something else or other? Well, we use statistical mechanics. In particular, we use the equipartition theorem that tells us that if the system is at, a, at equilibrium, so we have to wait. We can calculate non-equilibrium, but we need to wait for equilibrium. And if the system's at equilibrium, at a temperature T, then the energy associated with each degree of freedom, per degree of freedom, is 1 half Kb times T. Kb is the Boltzmann's constant. T is the temperature. So the energy with each degree of freedom is 1 half Kt. That's all we need to know. So in our simulation, we, will, we, can, we have an atom moving around. And we're treating these atoms as hard spheres. And these are spheres which don't rotate. They can rotate. And of course, there's some energy associated with rotation. But a sphere is very little energy compared to, say, a, a dumbbell-shaped object. So we'll assume no rotation, no vibration. They have potential energy as well. But this is saying for each degree of freedom, which are the different motions it could have, the different ways it could move, there's 1 half kT, so the potential is not coming in. So the kinetic energy of our system is easy to evaluate. It's just the translational kinetic energy. So it's m over 2, the sum of all particles of 1 half mv squared. That's it. The average here means we have to take the average over time, because we'll calculate the energy at any one instant. But it, these things vary. There's potentials interacting. Uh, we have various time steps which the system's moving through. So take the average over time. Whenever you're doing statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, averages are good, because we're only talking about the average uh, properties of these systems. Okay. So what do we have? We have three degrees of translational energy. So the average kin kinetic energy should be capital N, the number of particles, times 3 times 1 half kT, or 3 halves kT times N. So the temperature we can associate with our collection of atoms bouncing around inside their box is this given by the equation here. The temperature is proportional to the kinetic energy on the average, and multiply by 2, divide by 3, and Boltzmann's constant and n. So equation 2 tells us how we can deduce a temperature for a given bunch of atoms. How about the pressure? Well, the pressure is a little more complicated, and we use the Virial theorem. So Virial theorem right here. So if you don't remember that, you can look it up in your mechanics book in this case. Also look it up in the uh, thermodynamics, statistical mechanics book. But the virial theorem for our case here deals with the average force on an individual molecule. So W is the average force on a molecule. And, it, and the pressure of a system is related to that by rho 3n, 2 times the kinetic energy plus W. That's equation 3. So notice here that if W is 0, if the particles had no force on them, we would just have, I covered that up with my thumb here, okay? so if we, just, we would just have the ideal gas law. So the virial gives us the correction due to the interaction of the particles. And if we know what the force is, we can just calculate the average of that over time, and we get the correction to the ideal gas law. Okay? And rho here is just the density. So let's go ahead and look at this. How do we start a calculation off, is the question here. <clears throat> well, let me show you first. We have two codes here. Uh, one I think we give you as a sample, give you as a sample for one-dimensional uh, simulation, and the other for two-dimensional simulation. The, the snake here reminds you that I'm going to run the Python, Python simulation. So this is the actual code we have in the e-version in the e of the book. And let's run it here just to give you a feel. Yes, feel free to run it. And what you see here is a bunch of atoms which started off in the face-centered cubic configuration, which we think is the equilibrium. And there you can see there's the face-centered cubic 
being formed. I'm not sure if it started off in face-centered cubic or some other form, but then it certainly got to the face-centered cubic after a while. And you can see here how the kinetic energy changed over time, and now it's equilibrating to some way. But potential energy changed, too, because the total energy is constant. And, and it's finding its equilibrium configuration. Of course, when the number like this is small, uh, the FCC configuration, face-centered cubic, would be appropriate for a large number. Here, the surface effects are very big. Okay? But nevertheless, uh, that seems to be the configuration it's getting. Energy and kinetic energy seems to be getting constant. And so you should be asking the question, how can that be? What's holding the particles in here? In the where's the surface? Okay, why They should be moving around. This one's, well, we'll see. How do we do this? Let's close this. Here's our back. Okay? So how do you start off? We start off by giving the atoms some characteristic velocity distribution dependent on their temperature. Okay? So we could say, let's start off with the system at some temperature, which will be some kinetic energy. Okay? So it's not the true temperature of the system, because the temperature is defined for a system in equilibrium. And the system will equilibrate, will reach equilibrium, and at some other temperature. So we start off with some velocity distribution characteristic of a temperature. And then that's just saying we start off giving the system some kinetic energy. It's whatever configuration it's in, it has potential. And then we just let the system equilibrate in time, move it ahead step by step. And the kinetic and potential energies exchange with each other until they find an equilibrium configuration. And then things should stabilize. Notice here, and it's good to emphasize, you know, I'll rub over that a little bit, there's randomness. We're starting off with a molecular distribution like Monte Carlo, a Maxwellian distribution, Gaussian random distribution for the particles. Does that mean we're building randomness into the calculation? No. You know, we, we use randomness for, for Monte Carlo when we had no dynamics. That was the replacement. Here we're just using it to speed up the calculation comes in, but you could start any place, would just take much longer to equilibrate. Plus, here we have a feel like we're starting at a certain non-equilibrium temperature, then let the system equilibrate. So it's an interesting way to do it. And finally, how do we generate a random distribution with a Gaussian shape? Go back to some of our earliest lectures, and we talked about that, or at least it was in the book. I remember reading it in the book. Anyway. So it's as simple as just summing up a bunch of random numbers. So if you have a random number generator, which generates numbers between 0 and 1, you know, so if this is 0 and this is 1, and we usually generate random numbers between them, what will the average be? Well, the average will be 1 half, always. Okay? So if you add up a bunch of random numbers between 0 and 1, and you take the average of that, what, what do you get? You get a distribution of numbers with a Gaussian peak, it's round on the top here. That's better. About the average, about a half. So all you have to do is take a sum of random numbers, the usual random number generator, uniform, and divide, take its average, and you get a Gaussian distribution, as simple as that. So it's really pretty straightforward. How do we do it? Here comes that beautiful figure, which I told you is the, the one interesting part of the whole calculation. Look at it for a second. Well, we're trying to simulate, say, 10 to the 23rd particles. But we're only going to use, say, 10 to the 3rd, maybe 10 to the 6, maybe a million or a 1,000 in our simulation, just because that's a large number as it is to take care of. And we're not trying to do a research thesis. If you do a research thesis, you can run it for months. I don't care. But for homework, I don't want you to say, I'll give my homework in two months from now. It's running. No. We have to do that. So we have to have limits. Computers are finite uh, in all ways. How memory is finite. Our time is finite. So we put the particles in a box. So this diagram here, this beige box in the middle, is the simulation region. This is the volume in which we have all of our particles. Now here I only have five particles, but you might have 100, 200, 1,000, a million. Putting them inside the box. Okay. We have to have them in a box just so we have a finite volume in which to look, in which to keep the particles. But that's already a restriction. That's very artificial because particles 
should be in the container, you know, something of a finite size, like my, my cup here, you know, not a little box on the computer. And these walls here, where the particles either reflect or do something, are artificial constructs, which only go to change the real realism, decrease the realism of the calculation. Okay? So as the number of particles go down, particularly if you're using a small number of particles, the effect of the surface goes up and up. Okay? So the, the ratio of surface per volume increases as the number gets smaller and smaller. So the thing to do, of course, is to use a large number of particles so surface effects are very small. How large a number is it? Like a thousand? Well, if you have a thousand particles, you could start them off, let's say we put them in a 10 by 10 by 10 cube. So that's 100 times 10, that's a thousand particles at the lattice sites. Okay? How many are on the surface? Well, if we step in one site, one from here, one from here, one from there, you know, one from there, on all sides, we'd have a cube which is 8 by 8 by 8, and that would have no surfaces. So the number of particles on the surface is 10 to the third, which is how many are on the, uh, the total number, minus the number, if you step in one from each side, which is 8 to the third, and that's 488 particles. So essentially, even a 1,000 particles in a cube has about one half of them on the surface. So the surface effects are huge. Okay, so 1,000 particles, you expect very big artificial surface effects. So this is a problem. If you go to a million particles, that number falls to 6%, but 6% is still not very good precision. When we like, you know, we have these big computers you paid a lot of money for, you want to do better than that. So there's a technique. The technique is known as periodic boundary conditions, or PBC. And you, we use this sometimes when you solve for like waves to say, let's just make it periodic over space. We do the same thing here, only it's a little more subtle because we're dealing with particles in a box. So we have our interaction volume, simulation volume, in the middle here in beige. And we now just repeat this, at least in our minds, out to infinity. So here's another simulation volume. Here's another one all the way out here. Here's another one all the way out, in all possible directions. So we have all of space covered with this box to infinity. That's interesting. Okay. And what we demand is we want the physics the velocities, the accelerations, to be continuous at the boundaries. So whatever's happening in this box is going to happen at this box in exactly the same way, and it'll be continuous as you cross the boundary. You won't know that you've gone from one box to another. That sounds good, but how do you do that? Because each time we step through the equations of motion, we look at a longer and longer time, the particles, you know, they're like little puppies. They go wherever they want. Okay, you have to, you know, you can put a gate up for them, but we can't. We just said we have to make it continuous. So what we do here is we say, well, look at Mr. Yellow here, the yellow puppy. If it moves outside, tries to move outside of our box, which it can do, it's you know, it's free world for them. Another number four from the top moves in. Mm -hmm. So this is called an image, uh, the one outside the box, and for every time. A particle moves out of the box, an image moves in from the opposite side. So that's, you know, we put that in the, in the simulation by saying if x goes, to x, x goes to x plus l sub x, one unit length over, if x is less than zero, so if you try to go negative here outside the box, another one comes in. Or if you try to go on the other side, you, you, another one comes in. Okay, so we can build, say that mathematically by saying if one comes in, another leaves. Right there, five, you know, five moves out, five comes in here, or that's fine. We also see in this diagram, so these are these arrows, that's the heavy arrow was, is indicating the image moving in. We also see that there's interaction. So not only do the particles interact inside the simulation volume with each other, but they interact with all the particles nearby. That's kind of weird, and you have to be careful with that. So we see here the interactions, but that means, OK, so number two and three are interacting like that, and number two and three are also interacting within the volume. But it makes the whole thing continuous, and it's just a way of making a small number of particles seem much larger. It's a technique. You may not think it's mathematically proven to be exactly what's happening in nature, and it's not. But it's like uh, 
taking a thermodynamic average, using randomness to simulate the dynamics. Here we're using this technique to use a small number seem very large, make the system behave, simulate a much larger number. OK, so let's look at the next slide. How do we actually do this in the calculation? Well, as we've said, computers are finite, which means the box we use is finite. The number of particles we're using is finite. But we have another finiteness here, too. This potential we're using, which is in red, the Leonard-Jones potential, you can see here falls off very quickly. It goes out to zero. Well, that means physicists, computational physics, can be practical. Okay? And we have to take advantage of that. So we have each particle interacting with all other particles in principle. Not just in the nearest boxes, but the farther boxes, all the way out to infinity. That's an infinite number of interactions. Okay? That's hard to keep track of. So even with this model of repeating the boxes, we have too many interactions. But now we're smart. If we look at the Leonard-Jones potential, one, the minimum occurs here at about 1.13 sigmas. Okay, so sigma, recall, is the length scale. So at the typical length here, we have a certain potential. If we go out th roughly three times that, we go out to this region, the potential is essentially zero. Well, here, it's, of course, it's, it's down by a factor of 200. Okay? So you go out a little further, 500. Tell me how much you want it down, I'll tell you how far to go out. But we'll say, OK, when the potential's down to one, you know, two hundredths of what it was, we can forget about it. So we actually cut the potential off. We say that the potential for r greater than about 2.5 sigma, feel free to change that number, experiment. We set that to zero. So what that means here is if this is the potential in red, and I'll empty, I won't move it out here because there's nothing to show, we'll say, OK, here, we're saying the potential looks like that. It goes to zero at some artificial point. Over here, I've drawn it. Actually, it's 2.5, so it's really out here, but then there's nothing I, I can show you. Okay? Well, if that happens, remember this, this edge here. This is what the potential looks like. So I'll redraw it here in my, using my wonderful artistic sense. So the potential looks something like that. Remember that. Okay? So as we w make that cutoff, the good news is essentially only interactions with the nearest neighbors matter. Because the outs outside, two boxes away, you're already beyond the cutoff. There's no potential. Okay? So we don't have to worry about it. So only nearest neighbor images we have to worry about. So we have this particle. They interact on the other side images as well. But only the nearest image we have to worry about. There is a problem. The problem is, if, is as you recall, since you know, our potential cutoff means the potential looks something like this. Whoops. Well, OK. I did it. You know, it looks something like that at some point. This edge here has an infinite slope, an infinite derivative. And the force is proportional to the derivative of the potential. So the force at this one little point here is infinite. So we no longer have a conservative force once we cut off the potential. Because it's not conservative because the derivatives fail to exist. And energy won't be conserved precisely any longer with this model. So that's a, a problem mathematically. Physically, it's a small effect, because we only make this cutoff where the potential is very small. It's down by orders of an order of two or three orders of magnitude, so that the energy non-conservation should only be a one, you know, one in a thousand effect, one in five hundred effect. It also should be a very small effect. So but that's one of the things for you to see in practice. Okay. So what's left? One piece is left to the hard work. How do we actually integrate the differential equations? So we'll talk about that on this next slide. OK, so you can be asking, hey, you, work, you worked us to the bone with that RK4 algorithm. Why, why don't we just use that? You know, I'm afraid to mention anything else to you. You always say, use RK4, use RK4. It is industrial strength. It works amazingly well over a broad range of potentials, of differential equations. It's high precision, relatively fast. Why not use it here? Feel free. Go ahead. But what we're doing now is we're solving these equations 
ideally in three dimensions, okay, one, two, three, because we want three dimensional volumes to be realistic. We probably have a billion, 10 billion, maybe 100 billion time steps we'll look at because we need to wait for the system to equilibrate. That's a lot of time steps. And we may be dealing with a thousand or a million particles. This becomes a very big computational headache. And the best thing to do is probably take it to computer science colleagues and say, put this on the biggest parallel machine. It's not trivial to do even there. And there's a lot of bookkeeping. And you want to keep the calculation simple. So RK4 is fine. But we need something, or we typically use something that's a little quicker, a little simpler, not as precise, but that we can build in to the algorithm itself without having to call a separate function. Okay? So the, the most popular one, or the simplest one, is called the Verlet algorithm. And it's really just the central difference approximation for the second derivative. Okay? And we need the second derivative because accelerations come in. So equation one here is Newton's law. Force on the left-hand side, function of the position of every particle at time t. So at each time the positions change, you have to use the appropriate position, is equal to the mass. And we'll set the mass equal to 1 just to keep the equation simple. You can do that in the simulation. Just say the mass scale is 1. Fine. And times the acceleration, d squared r by dt squared. And the forward, the central difference approximation, which is a good approximation, better than forward difference, for this second derivative is given on the right-hand side of equation 1. There's that characteristic minus 2r. Remember where I said really you should be, should be subtracting 1r there and the other r from there. But here, it's easiest to write it down as minus 2r. And that tells us, aha, we have a force at time t, position at time t plus h, position at time t minus h, and a position at time t. So this lets us go from t earlier time to later time. So if we solve equation 1 for the position at a later time, we get the position of particle i at one time step forward from the presence. present is twice the present position minus its previous position plus h squared times the force acting at time t. That's it. That's how we can solve the equation of motion. Very simple. Wow, that's pretty easy. It's good to order h to the fourth, which is good order. And notice also that we never bother calculating velocities. So this Verlet al algorithm gives you the position at any time. If you want the velocity, easy enough just to take differences. Okay. But other than that, it's very quick, works very well. It has some problems sometimes with stability. It almost works too well, too jumps too quickly. And so there's an improved version of it known as velocity Verlet. And that solves for r and v together. And that's given on equations 3 and 4 here. And let's look at these equations. And that says to move the position from time t forward to time t plus h, we start with the present position. We say, aha, we'll use just h delta t, the time times the present velocity. That's good. That's moving it forward. That's like Euler, a forward difference. And then we have here at the h squared times with the acceleration. So this is just, hey, this is just x is equal to x0 plus v0t plus 1 half, t f, 1 half a t squared. Okay, This is just basic kinematic relation. That's fine, as we get from uniform acceleration. So we just assume uniform acceleration over the time interval. That's what equation 3 th gives us. And the velocity is then just the velocity, initial time, plus the time h times the average velocity over the interval. So the average velocity over the interval makes this a higher order calculation. Rather than taking the acceleration like we did here for the force at the beginning of the interval, we take this as the sum over the beginning and end values of the force or the, to get the acceleration. And in practice, that means even though this looks like a lower order, the precision, when taken together, is about the same as the Verlet, but this is more stable. So work that out if you'd like. That's called, called the velocity Verlet. You can use either. You can try either. They both work. They're both fast. Uh, not quite as good as RK4, but much easier to implement. OK, so how do you do the implementation? Here we have some examples. And here we'll talk about what your code should be doing. 
so here, here's the figure, recall, and the figure shows us the energy versus time. Okay? And on the top part of the figure, it's for 36 particles in a two-dimensional box, and on the bottom, it's for 300 particles. So what you should see is 36 particles should have much greater statistical fluctuations, and sure enough, they do. Very good. Uh, 300 particles should have smaller statistical variations, and so they do. However, 36 particles will equilibrate more quickly. 300 takes, takes longer. I don't think we need to buy this now. Thank you. 300 takes longer, and it takes, as you see here. How do we know what's plotted in this? Well, it says energy, but at least it has a zero. Okay? I, I always insist label things better than this, but you know students did, did this and I'm happy to take whatever they give me to use. So this is the zero of energy here. So obviously if it's positive energy that's the kinetic energy and if it's a negative energy that's the potential energy because the system binds together. So it has to be negative. And here too, the more particles we still have negative potential. Notice that the constant total energy is constant. That's good because we spoke about possible difficulties arising with energy conservation when we use the cutoff potential, so it's not purely conservative, it obviously is not a big effect, even though you know it looks constant as can be. And you see in both cases what's happening. The initial energy here is equilibrating some kinetic and potentials changing back and forth, and then the system just changes very slowly and it eventually equilibrates. Okay? So here's the code. We can run it again. That's the code running. Okay, that's as simple as that. We'll see, you've seen that before. Play with that code. Look at that code because we want you to see what's going on inside that code, but we give you a code to look at because, uh, there it is, thank you. To start with, it's not very hard, complicated, but I don't recommend you write your own from scratch because it's just, you have to get everything right and there's a lot of little details. So here we give you, I think this is the one-dimensional version of the code, and you should study this. There's not very much to it, as you can see here. Most of that is just you know, the interactions, and here is the algorithm going ahead. You know, and study it. That's in practice what you do with a research code. And what we recommend here doing is start with this code and look at it. Okay, look at how it works. So here you, you know, we, we start off this code with uh, the the atoms in a face-centered cubic lattice, because we know that's the equilibrium configuration for Leonard Jones potential. But that's only at equilibrium when the kinetic and potential energy has changed, and when it's at the right spacing, which we don't know. So the system will move and find its equilibrium configuration. How many particles do you start with? Well, in order for them to fit on the sites in a lattice for an FCC a crystal structure, you have to have 4 times n cubed particles. So that's equal to 32, 108, and so forth. So you have to start with one of these numbers in order for everything to fit on. Start with the Maxwellian uh, velocity distribution. So that means like you're something like you're starting at a definite temperature. Equal, it's not an equilibrium. And then you know how to start. Study the code like I was just trying to do with you in a very brief way. How I like means, you know, with a, with a pencil, with a highlighter, print it out for your own sake. You can do it on the computer if you want. Circle the parts of the code which solve the ordinary differential equation. Because these are Newton's laws are ordinary differential equations. Circle the parts which impose the periodic boundary conditions. Okay? Circle the parts which deal with the image interaction. Okay? And finally, circle the parts which deal with the cutoff. And you should see that pretty much covers the code. And these are the basic physics or, or algorithm aspects that are in the code. How long do you have to run? Well, for the constants given to you in the text, about 10 to the fourth, maybe 10 to the fifth steps to equilibrate, and that corresponds to about 10 to the minus ninth seconds. So, you know, atoms equilibrate very quickly, okay, but, you know, they don't have very far to travel. What value of h, the time step, should you use? Get, use the largest ones for which the system remains stable. You want to make it larger and larger so it's faster and faster, so you can do more 
But then if you make it too large, the system becomes unstable because the algorithms are only good to some order of h, h to the third, h to the fourth, so h has to be a small number. To see if it works, compared to the figures in the book, the one of these, the ones I'll show you on the next slide as well. And then what you want to do is evaluate when the system has equilibrated the average energy, the average over time. It's equilibrated, it looks like here, let it then average over time to determine this energy, the kinetic energy here, see what it's like as a function of time. And that gives you a value for the final temperature for the system. And then look, is there some simple relation between the initial temperature that I start the system off at and the final temperature at which it equilibrates? Okay. So on the next slide, we show you the answer to those questions. So let's, this is the last one, so it's time for you to get to work. Here's from one of our sample calculations. Here's the final temperature determined by just taking the time average of kinetic energy, and here's the initial kinetic energy. And we have here five points, and you see pretty much they follow a linear relation. Okay? So the more energy you start with, the higher the temperature, just what you'd expect. More interesting, I think, is you can calculate, once the system is equilibrated, its temperature but by calculating the average of that force and the virial theorem, you can calculate the average, the virial, and you can calculate the average pressure of the system. And you can say, what's the relation between P and T? And remember, for an ideal gas, we know that PV is equal to NKT, so the two are proportional. Okay? Volume's not changing, so we expect pressure and temperature to be proportional, a straight line. What we see here is we don't get a straight line. Good. That means we don't have an ideal gas. We don't. We have interactions occurring. Okay. So that's good. See what shape you get. See how it depends. You can change the Leonard-Jones potential, etc. Finally, increase the temperature. Note, note how the system looks different. You know, look at some of the trajectories. Look at the uh, position of the particles every 100 time steps or so, and the velocities. See how this changes, how the interactions change with temperature. What you should have, of course, is as you raise the temperature, you're giving the system more energy. They can bang to each other, more, get more close. You'll have more violent collisions. You can have bigger changes in the velocities. You should see that. Create an animation. Okay, you know, we, I, I showed you one with uh, already from we created in our Python. Uh, students have created other ones of particles interacting. Try that yourself because this really is a time-dependent phenomenon, and you want to see what happens as a function of time. And finally, what happens as you heat a solid? Well, as you heat a solid, it's the atoms vibrate more and more, and so calculate the root mean square radius for the solid as a function of temperature. See what happens as you heat it up. It should increase with temperature. And finally, time reversal invariance. Okay? Now, for those of you who studied nuclear and particle physics, you know this is a fundamental law of nature. Atomic physicists test it as well. We believe that the basic physics of nature is time reversal invariant. That means if we just reversed all of the positions, x goes to minus x, and v goes to minus v, okay, so we turn all the particles around, or, or just you can keep x the same, you can just turn them all around, uh, they, should they should run backwards and give us the initial configuration. So forget about that. That would be parity. Just turn the particles around at any time and let time run backwards, okay? which, which means just let, let time run forward with negative velocities for every particle. See if they go back to where they started. It's an interesting test both of the theory to see if the points are good and of the algorithm. So. We have enough here for you to play with. Run the algorithm, then try to do something more interesting with it. But this is molecular dynamics. It's pretty simple. It's incredibly powerful. So let's get, go ahead, go to your lab. Next time, we'll start talking about simulations using partial differential equations. But these are still ordinary, and remember that for next time. Bye-bye.